good evening. We are ready to go for tonight. And uh, welcome to this lecture. It's lecture number six. And tonight we're going to look at Bible translations. And I'll introduce you to some of the Bible study tools that we can use uh, in order to understand the Bible better. Um, this is one of the shorter lectures. However, once I get on the roll and I get into preaching mode, then it may actually go a little bit longer uh, than I anticipate. But I don't want to make any promises, but by 9 o'clock, hopefully you will be out of here. As we start, I want to share with you tonight uh, something from the book of Nehemiah. You want to know more about Nehemiah and the background and the book of Nehemiah and its message, then you need to register for the next module because that's when we will uh, talk about that in depth. But in chapter 8 of Nehemiah, we also read about Ezra. Now, that's an interesting occurrence because we're talking about the book of Nehemiah and yet we have um, a mention here of Ezra. And Ezra was a scribe. Nehemiah was a person who was born in captivity, and, and probably so was Ezra. Both of them, uh, if you remember that timeline, came to Jerusalem from out of captivity, uh, or at that stage it was, it, it was by their own free will that they basically stayed, or probably their own free will that they stayed or remained uh, in Babylon. And uh, Nehemiah heard about the difficulties in Jerusalem, and especially around the, the broken wall of Jerusalem, and he made it his task to go and repair, restore, and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. But uh, after that whole long story, and we don't have time to go into that, and I, I don't want to tell you that story now, um, that's why I invite you to come back to the next module so that we can actually talk about that story, the, the story of Nehemiah. But in chapter 8, we read about Ezra. Now, somewhere along the line, Ezra also came to Jerusalem. Scholars debate the dates and the times and everything related to that, uh, but it seems like Ezra and Nehemiah overlapped uh, to some extent in the city of Jerusalem. And here we have an incident which I want to highlight, which is uh, relevant for our study of this evening. And it says at the end of chapter 7, when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man, in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. I, I just want to stop there and highlight that. They listened attentively. Uh, I, just want to, I just want to give that to you right now because he read that for not just um, a 40-minute sermon slot. He read that for half a day. And um, so just be very grateful that you have relatively soft seats and, and preachers who... I guess most of the time go over time anyway, but at least not as long as this. Now Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mattatiah, Shammah, Ananiah, Uriah, and a whole host of others. And I'm not going to read those names because there are too many of them and I can't pronounce them. So Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Note another difference from our services. They all stood up and listened to the law being read for all of those hours. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites... Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, and again another host of those names, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Now, there's a little footnote in the NIV here when it says, making it clear, it can also be translated translating it 
In other words, while Ezra was reading, there were the Levites who translated or interpreted, whichever interpretation or translation you prefer. The, uh, the point is very clear, is that as Ezra read from the law, which was written in Hebrew, and by now, during the Persian Empire and even slightly before, the people spoke Aramaic, which was a related language, but far, far away enough so that people did no, no longer, uh, people no longer understood, fluently understood the Hebrew that was read. So they needed some people to interpret and to translate what was in the law. Very interesting story that goes back more than 400 years before Christ when Nehemiah and Ezra ministered together in the city of Jerusalem. Now, we're going to talk about Bible translation, and most of us probably take it for granted. But tonight, I want to show to you and prove to you in a very, very brief overview of the history. We don't have time to go into the history of Bible translation. But just very briefly, uh, help us to understand that it wasn't always that easy. And even the church at some stages in the history erred, grossly erred, by not allowing translations to be made of the Bible. And then as we continue, I'll introduce you to some of the translation philosophy, and then also we are going to look at some of the translations that resulted in English, uh, and then at the end we're going to look at some Bible study tools. At the end of the day, what I want to uh, instill in all of us is the fact that God wants to speak to us, and uh, God wants to speak to me in a language that I understand. And the best example of that is the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. When God needed to really touch my heart, He spoke a language, the language of love. It's a language that I can identify with, that I can understand. That God loved the world so much that He sent His Son Jesus into this world to die for us. And, and that's the language that God wants to speak to us. It's a love language. But over and above that, tonight we're going to look at our cultural language or the audible language, the language that we speak uh, and, and need to hear, physically hear. And we need to thank God uh, that we actually do have the Bible translated in a language that we can easily uh, understand and identify with. Let's pray together as we launch into the lecture. Our Father, we thank you that you have continued to be involved in your creation. And even when we rebelled and sinned against you and turned our backs on you, Lord, you came into this world, you pursued us with your love, and Jesus Christ died to take our sins away and to open the way for us to have a personal and an intimate relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that we have record of that in the written word in the Bible, which is the topic of our study in this module. And thank you that you've given us this opportunity to come together like this, to study and to learn more. Bless us tonight as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week <clears throat> we uh, uh, looked at what I regard to be a fairly complicated and intricate subject the subject of textual criticism. The question being, the actual wording in the Bible, the text of the Bible as we saw last week, uh, how do we know that we can trust the actual words that have been transmitted? And we talked about Bible transmission. And through the study or the science of textual criticism, it is possible for scholars to give us a, a huge amount of confidence that what we have in our printed Bible today is probably as close as we will get uh, to the originals. We also recognize that we, we don't have the originals uh, anymore. The oldest piece of document dates back at this stage to about 120, 125 AD, which is very close to the actual writing of the New Testament. And then uh, we have complete Bibles uh, that date from the 4th century and then um, thousands of other manuscripts dating from that point on. And so I have also used the NIV translation. Uh, I have discovered since then that the uh, ESV English Standard Version 
doesn't even refer to all of the footnotes, for example, but the NIV still includes uh, the footnotes to help us to understand why they have opted for a particular reading in the text. Uh, they, have, they don't comment on the translation, they comment on the reading. Here and there you have a footnote like the one I just highlighted in, in Nehemiah, where it is a translation issue. You can translate it either as translate or interpret, uh, whichever way. But what we looked at last week was not about interpretation or translation. It was really about the actual text and the manuscripts consulted by these different scholars who produce the Greek and the Hebrew texts from which we then make the translations uh, and how we can trust those uh, manuscripts as well. Um, in this lecture tonight, we will be looking, as I highlighted already, the translation of the Bible, some of the philosophies and guidelines followed by scholars when they do these translations, and then we're going to give special attention to the English translation of the Bible. Right at the end, I'm going to show you some Bible tools, and I can really, again, just scratch the surface in terms of the tools that are available for us to understand the Bible better. If you have uh, the textbooks, and don't be too concerned about the textbooks Johnston and Harris, uh, because they are sometimes difficult to, to get hold of, uh, any book in that same realm uh, with the same kind of information is perfectly fine. Um, I'm just using these two as the samples for this, so even when I, when I uh, mention them as prescribed textbooks, I don't necessarily mean you've got to have them, otherwise you are lost somehow or the other. Uh, that's not what I mean. Now, when it comes to the New Bible Dictionary or any other dictionary, if it is a Bible dictionary, then the topic of our discussion tonight will not be covered in most Bible dictionaries. Because we're now moving beyond the Bible and words in the Bible and background of the Bible. All those things are covered in Bible dictionaries. But tonight we're talking about a process that really happened throughout Christian church history for the last 2,000 years. And so the Bible dictionaries don't necessarily cover this particular topic. But of course there has been a lot written uh, on the topic of Bible translation and Bible tools or, or study tools uh, that we want to use. As we check in, I want you to grab a, a pen and write down um, the books, the names of the books of the New Testament from Matthew to 2 Thessalonians. And I hope that you have a, a better knowledge and a memory around the New Testament. We use the New Testament again and again and again. And uh, so the New Testament actually comes a lot easier than uh, the Old Testament, and more specifically than the prophets, the prophetic section uh, in the Old Testament. That is not always that easy. So tonight and then next week, we will complete the whole of the New Testament. And then test yourself and do this exercise again and again. Um, I often forget, um, maybe a book in the Bible may, may slip my memory, or when I start reciting them, especially when I do that verbally, I may not remember all the books of the Bible that well. Um, I may slip out or skip out on one or two of them. But uh, just test yourself again and again and go through that list to make sure that you know the books of the Bible and where to find them. And once you complete it, check your own work. And then by next week, you will know all the books, the names of the books of the Bible. That's exciting. Okay, by way of introduction for tonight. The Westminster... Confession of Faith was drawn up in 1647, 1646 rather, and uh, it has certain articles which is like a statement of faith. You want to know more about statements of faith, uh, here is another invitation. Come to the final module, the fourth one, because there we will talk about what it means to have a statement of faith and the things that we believe. I refer to that as the big picture. But that's essentially what we're going to talk about in that one. Now, we're not going to discuss them all in detail uh, in that final module, but in that module we talk about some of the major things that we believe and some of the debates around that. And uh, so it's a very exciting time. In fact, it's one of the highlights for us uh, in the year to, to really grapple with some of those issues. Um, but in the Westminster Confession of Faith, and, and you will see the language is rather old, uh, it says this about the Bible. The Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek being immediately inspired by God and by His singular care and providence kept pure in all ages are therefore authentic. So as 
in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal uh, unto them. But because these original tongues are not known to all people of God, who have right unto, and that's the Greek and the Hebrew referring to, an interest in the Scriptures, and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them, therefore they are to be translated in the vulgar language of every nation unto which they come, that the Word of God dwelling plentifully in all, they may worship in Him in an acceptable manner." and through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, may have hope. Now, we don't speak that sort of language anymore, and more specifically, we don't refer to any language in the world as a vulgar language, except certain words in a language may be vulgar, but no one language in the world would nowadays be referred to as vulgar. So obviously it goes back to the 17th century, uh, and it really meant common language in those days. So it really just shows you how words actually can change meaning uh, over a long period of time. It is clear from this statement, however, uh, as well as from our own personal experiences, that translating the Bible is not, not only permitted, but actually absolutely essential in order for us to have access to the Word of God. I, I think it's very logical. Um, the, this need was clearly recognized by the early church, and um, I've already referred to that last week when we talked about the different manuscripts. Um, one of the witnesses to the text of the Bible, we actually find, and it's a secondary witness, uh, but we find many translations of the Bible that go back into the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries. So they are also very, very old. And we're talking about Coptic and Aramaic and, and Latin and, and several others as well. So why would we even talk about translating the Bible? You may think it's logical, and it, it actually is very, very logical. But the motivation for translating the Bible can be seen from a statement uh, regarding Jerome's Latin translation. And this is how it reads from historyworld.net. It says, The intention of St. Jerome, translating into Latin the Hebrew, uh, of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament was that ordinary Christians of the Roman Empire should be able to read the Word of God. Ignorance of the Scriptures, he wrote, is ignorance of Christ. Now, it's one thing to proclaim Christ, and obviously Christ needs to be proclaimed so that people can understand who He is. But if you don't know the Scriptures upon which we base our understanding of Jesus Christ, then you won't have an understanding of Christ uh, anyway. So even way back in the 4th century when Jerome started the Latin translation of the whole Bible, he believed that translating it would introduce people to Jesus Christ. And the reasons why we today would translate the Bible is, number one, because most people do not read Greek and Hebrew, at least not fluently. Uh, it really takes several years of study in any one of the two languages in order to be at a point where you can literally pick up um, a Hebrew or a Greek text and read it relatively fluently. The languages develop. Any language develops over time. I just gave you a sample from the Westminster Confession of Faith. The word vulgar has developed. We, we don't use the word in the same way that it was used back then. Um, I, I can give you plenty of examples how words have actually changed meaning. Um, and, and I'm sure that you can come up with your own uh, examples of that as well. But the Greek and the Hebrew used in the Bible are actually dead languages. I mean, they were spoken uh, long years before Christ, uh, many, many years before Christ. By the time Jesus came, uh, Greek was spoken, the whole of the New Testament written in Greek, and even modern Greek and modern Hebrew are not exactly the same. They have developed, they have been modernized, and so even modern Greeks are picking up the Bible, obviously they would be able to read it, but they, they will need a bit of extra help in order to go back 2,000 years ago in order to fluently understand or read the Greek. So language is developed, and then people need to hear God speaking to them through the word in their own language. And, and you can imagine if I'm here and I start uh, tonight and I, I recite some stuff in Greek or in Hebrew here. Um, so most of you will look at me with, with empty eyes saying, what in the world is he actually doing? Unless we have someone here with the interpretation, the, the gift of interpretation to interpret what I'm saying. Um, but I think by and large, most of you will sit there not knowing what's going on. In fact, I won't know what's going on because I don't read it fluently either. 
Um, and the, the reasons for and the need uh, for translation or translating the Bible uh, may be very logical to us today, but it wasn't always recognized by everyone, not even in, in the Christian church history. And so very briefly, we're going to look at just some of the, uh, the highlights, uh, maybe lowlights, if one should say, uh, of the struggle for Bible translation uh, in history. Some of the early translations of the Old Testament, uh, the Jews, because of their belief that the text of the Scriptures itself was sacred. In fact, they would take the, a manuscript, the Hebrew manuscript, and, and even the little letter and the space and the size of the letter, they, believe, they believed to have been inspired and therefore holding you don't touch it. And because they believed that, they had a major struggle, number one, to copy it, and number two, and this is more important even, to translate it. Because the moment you translate, you change, in inverted commas. You, you begin to interpret. I mean, any one of us here will know, and uh, because I speak two languages, I'll use that as an example. If I say to you, um, my nose runs, and you need to translate that into Afrikaans, you are not going to say, my nose heart loop. You will say, my, my nose loop. And if I say to you, my nose loop, you won't translate it, my nose walks. It, it's, it's a logical thing. So the moment you do translation, you're using different words, different concepts, in order to bring a particular concept uh, across uh, to whoever is reading uh, or listening to you. But because the Jews felt like the Hebrew itself was the inspired language, they resisted translations. But only for a while, because logically, as we have just seen from Nehemiah, there came a time when people no longer understood Hebrew fluently. Most of the people at the time spoke and understood Aramaic. That again, in turn, was eventually replaced by Greek by the time Jesus walked the earth. Now, Jesus himself spoke Aramaic, but the, the language of the world at the time was really Greek. And so... It didn't take long for the Bible somewhere along the line to be translated into Aramaic. And we are referring to those as uh, the Targums. And the Targums in, he in, in the Jewish world are actually translations of the Hebrew into the Aramaic language. And there are plenty of examples, as we have seen just a very brief example uh, last week. And then the Septuagint, and I have only briefly referred to this, um, in fact I think we have referred to this last week, uh, when we talked about uh, the 70 or however many scholars it, it is believed who, has, who sat down and translated uh, the, the, the Old Testament into the Greek language. And that happened in the 2nd century uh, AD. Uh, maybe not with any official permission from the Jewish authorities, but again the need arose for a Greek text because people at that stage spoke Greek uh, and they needed a translation that they could understand. Some of the early translations of the New Testament include Coptic, Syriac, Aramaic, Latin. And again, there was a need for this to happen. And although Greek was spoken uh, by the time Paul and others traveled around the world, the, Greek, uh, the, sorry, the Roman Empire was stamping its authority on the whole world. And slowly but surely, Greek as, a, as the lingua franca was replaced by Latin. And so eventually Latin became the language of the world. If you want to travel around in the Roman Empire, you needed to speak and be able to speak Latin. And so the churches reflected that. The early Christians reflected this need. And it was a long couple of centuries. And there was a need for the Bible to be translated in Latin as well. And so Jerome in the late 4th century translated the Gospels into Latin. And it is this translation that formed ultimately the basis of the well-known uh, Latin Vulgate, uh, which dominated the church history for many, many years, and more specifically during the Middle Ages, as we will see in a moment. This Latin Vulgate, um, and against the background of Alcuin's Vulgate, which is a 9th century document, uh, if you look at the screen uh, over there, uh, the Vulgate is largely, this is from Wikipedia, the result of the labors of Jerome, who was commissioned by Pope Damasus, or Damasus I in 382 
late 4th century, in other words, to make a revision of the old Latin translations. Now, that already should give you a, a clue, and that is there were older and other Latin translations in existence by this time. But they needed an, if you want to call it, an official Latin translation. And Jerome was asked to actually put the Bible uh, into Latin, to translate it into Latin. In the 13th century, this Latin translation became known as the Versio Vulgata, which means common translation. And there are 76 books in the Clementine edition of the Vulgate Bible, 46 in the Old Testament, and that includes a few Apocrypha, and then also 27 uh, in the New Testament. Jerome started this translation in 390, and it was completed in 405. So it took several years for the whole Bible to be completed in Latin. And then uh, it wasn't all just Jerome's work, because towards the end, uh, some other people assisted with that uh, as well. The value of the Latin um, and the Vulgate. Uh, in, in time, the Vulgate became uh, regarded as the only official Bible of the church. The church went the root of the Jews, in fact. Um, as much as the Jews regarded the Hebrew as the holy language, slowly but surely the church came to a point, and when I say the church, I mean the official church at the time, which eventually became the Roman Catholic Church. Um, it, it really came to regard the Latin as a holy language and the only language. And the priests then, uh, if you called into ministry, you had to go and study the language, and you were then able to read the language. But the normal person in the pew never really understood uh, Latin much, un unless you were schooled in it. Uh, the Vulgate is actually well preserved, talking about what we referred to last week, and that is textual criticism. It is a well preserved document, and scribes often took extreme care to make exact and beautiful copies uh, of that, as evidenced by many copies in uh, precise calligraphy. On the screen you have a sample of that sort of calligraphy that was, was well developed during the Middle Ages, where people took extreme care and with a flowy, flowing hand, they could, with a free hand, they could write beautiful uh, language. It's an art and a bit of a science that you can still uh, practice and learn about uh, even till today. Now, Wikipedia says during the Middle Ages, translation, particularly of the Old Testament, was discouraged. Nevertheless, there are some fragmentary Old English Bible translations. There's a lost translation of the Gospel of John into Old English by Venerable Bede, uh, which he is said to have prepared shortly before his death around 735. So there's evidence of other translations, uh, most of those done with no official um, sort of uh, permission by the church at the time. There's an old high German version of the Gospel of Matthew that dates to 748, um, and there are several other examples of some of these translations dating back to the Middle Ages. A brief word about um, the struggle for Bible translation, and on the picture you will see um, uh, an image of John Wycliffe that comes from uh, traditioninaction.org, uh, Pope Innocent III in 1199 banned unauthorized versions of the Bible as a reaction to the Cathar and Waldensian heresies. There was a good motive behind it because people used the Bible uh, to develop false doctrines all over the place and it's nothing new. It happened in the Bible times when Paul and others had to address some false teachings. But obviously the thing just spread uh, like, a, like cancer around the world at the time. And so there was an attempt here by the Pope to put an end to the false doctrines and not allowing people to translate the Bible uh, for themselves. The synods of Toulouse and Tarragona in 1234 outlawed possession of such renderings. There is evidence of some vernacular translations being permitted while others were being scrutinized. The most notable Middle English Bible translation, Wycliffe's Bible, uh, dating from 1383, based on the Vulgate, was banned by the Oxford Synod in 1408. A Hungarian Hussite Bible appeared in the mid-15th century, and in 1478, a, a Catalan translation in the dialect of Valencia. And, and so, um, there was a major movement to only approve the Latin Vulgate, 
but there is evidence of other translations being done, but those never really got a, a, a massive foothold uh, in church history at the time. Against the background, again, of an image of William Tyndale, um, uh, just to give you a, a, an example of the typical struggle for Bible translation. This may all sound very strange to us, but you may have heard the, the name Tyndale, uh, and you may certainly have heard the name Wycliffe, because the Wycliffe translated Bible translators is a modern-day missionary movement, and their entire purpose and task is to go around the world, identify languages where the Bible has not yet been translated, and then to send missionaries in there to study the, the language, learn the language, and then eventually to translate the language in uh, the Bible into that particular language. And so these are well-known names, but... Uh, tonight I'm trying to, to give you a bit of the historical picture behind that. For the most part, unofficial translations of the Bible were not allowed during the Middle Ages. But William Tyndale translated the Bible into English as early as the 16th century, in about 1526. And it was met with heavy sanctions, given the widespread belief that Tyndale changed the Bible. Now, if you have a belief that the Latin is the only holy translation and you then translate it into something else, then you, you would have gone against that by saying someone tried to change the Bible, and this was the accusation against Tyndale. William Tyndale was therefore first jailed in 1535 for translating the Old Testament without permission. And a year later, he was strangled and burned at the stake. In other words, the church killed a man for translating the Bible into English. And so when you hold your English Bible today, you need to really appreciate it. Some people literally um, spend their blood, they lost their lives to get the right for us to read the Bible in, in our own language today. But then there was a dawning of a new era, uh, the belief that the Bible should not be translated into common languages, vulgar languages, uh, as it's stated in the Westminster uh, Confession, dominated the church throughout the Middle Ages, but the Reformation changed many, many things. In fact, my personal belief is that the Reformation changed the world. It changed history. And uh, one of the things that it changed was this particular belief, and that is that the Bible must be made available to the common person, um, the, the man or the woman in the pew. And against the background of um, a picture or an image, rather, of Martin Luther, in 1521, Martin Luther was placed under the ban of the empire, and he retired to the Wartburg Castle. During this time there, he translated the New Testament from Greek into German, and it was printed in, 15, in September 1522. The first complete Dutch Bible that was partly based on, on um, Luther's Bible was also printed in Antwerp uh, in 1526. Today, there is very little argument for us uh, about the need to make the Bible available to every person. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's, it's a desire of us. It's a vision of the church now, uh, the, especially the evangelical church, and that is to make the Bible available uh, in every possible language uh, around the world. And part of the language that people use here is to make it available in the heart language of a person. If I wake you up at night, the first thing, the first kind of language that you speak is your heart language. Uh, some people call it your mother tongue. That's, that's the language that you learn, that, the, that your mother taught you. And many people grow up with that language. And the ideal, ultimately, is to have the Bible available in every single language spoken, the heart language of, of people. So sometimes people say, well, you know, the Bible has been translated in, in, in many thousands of languages. But there are still some languages, um, and, and most people around the world have access to those languages, but sometimes they have to move uh, to a second, a third, and even a fourth language in order to read the Bible in a language that they can understand. The ideal for, for Christian missionaries is to make the Bible available in the first language, the heart language of every single person uh, in the world. So what are the, what are the principles that, that are applied in Bible translation? Just a few words uh, and concepts that I want to introduce to you tonight as we understand the principles of Bible translation. Where do translators actually start? Well, first of all, they determine the need for a translation into another language. 
That is not that difficult when you discover a tribe somewhere, they have never heard about the gospel, and they speak a language in which the Bible has never ever been translated. Now, of, there's an immediate need. Uh, tonight, we're not going to talk much about that, because my topic here tonight is not missions, although I have mentioned that quite a few times. But the topic really is Bible translation in general. And so when we, when we look at the Bible, already we're talking King James, New King James, NIV, ESV, and the list goes on and on and on. How do we determine that there is actually a need for another English translation? And this is the task of translators, and that is asking the question, do people still identify in terms of their heart language and the language that comes immediately and can speak to them immediately and that they can understand? Uh, is that still the case? If not, then uh, in terms of language development, we are so far removed from the language of the Bible that people no longer immediately understand the language of the Bible. So that is when they, that's why they talk about the need for a translation. But also, those scholars who do the translations, and they are scholars because they need to have access to the Hebrew and the Greek, they need to be able to read that. And most of the time, as I will point out in a moment, they work in teams. Some people are more skilled in Hebrew, others are more skilled in Greek. And they work in teams, and, and they translate it from either the Hebrew or the Greek. But they have to determine their philosophy. What is the philosophy of translation? How do, are we going to translate word for word for word? Are we going to read a sentence or a paragraph, try and find and determine the meaning, and then find the best way of putting that in another language, even if we lose something of the word for word kind of translation? And I'll talk more about that also in a moment. And then, of course, one of the other things that they determine, which was the topic of last week, and that is, what is the best text? And there are different readings in the text. Um, and as I said last week, only in about 15% of the entire Bible, uh, at least when it comes to the New Testament, uh, do we have any alternate, alternative readings? And so translators then need to determine which of those words or uh, concepts um, or, or variants, as we called them last week, are we going to use. So that's determining the best text. And then the identity and the number of scholars who will work on a translation. I have pointed out when Jerome translated from uh, Greek and Hebrew into Latin, he worked for years in order to do that because he was a single one person working on his own, at least initially. Nowadays, it is very uncommon. In fact, you do have it sometimes, but it's not common for one single person to do a Bible translation uh, nowadays. They mostly work in teams, representing a particular theological perspective or a particular philosophy of translation, uh, and so on. And, and those things are determined before a translation is actually made. Now, when we look at the text of the Bible, as we discovered in, in the lecture last week, the science of textual criticism determines the best possible text or reading of the Bible to be used. And although not all Bible scholars agree on which is the best text, there is general agreement um, among most scholars today about 95% of the, of the entire Bible text. Uh, and then... Uh, you will see it in different translations when people have opted for a different text, such as, and I, I have introduced uh, you to that last week, such as John chapter 8, for example, where it is either included in the text, it is excluded altogether, or it is bracketed in the text or by way of a footnote or whatever. And so again, you need to determine, if you translate, you need to determine which, are, which text are you going to, to use, and you will see that in the different translations as you pick them up. Although the differences come in with the major portions that we looked at, uh, it is really only a small, small percentage uh, of the Bible text where you will find those differences. By and large, there is total agreement uh, on the text of the Bible, both the Old Testament Hebrew as well as the New Testament Greek. Now I want to give some attention to the theories of Bible translation. There are three main approaches to or philosophies of Bible translation. And there are all sorts of variations uh, in between. And what I'm going to do is to show you on, on the whiteboard, and I'll show you a slide also a bit later on um, how that can work. But on a 
on a scale from the one end, you may have what can be termed as a literal translation of the Bible. And on a scale, it, it will go all the way across to what has become known as a paraphrase. A paraphrase of the Bible. Um, literal translation is called or referred to as formal uh, equivalence. In other words, if it is at all possible, if I have a word in one language and I can always translate it with the exact same word in the other language, then I'm going to try and do it. We call it formal equivalence. Now, if you really push this far, then you will have the example that I used earlier on. Um, my nose walks. Because uh, luap in Afrikaans is walk in English. Um, I mean, that's logical, isn't it? But it's not that logical when you start doing translations. And all of us have had experiences uh, of that. On this particular scale, not too far away from the literal, you also have what has become known as dynamic equivalent. Dynamic equivalence. And then paraphrase. The difference between these approaches is an understanding about how to communicate the concepts in the source language, the original, in other words. How do you communicate the concept in the source into a receptor language? In other words, the language into which you are translating that. And the concept of meaning here is important. We have bought some items that were made in China. In fact, it's very difficult nowadays to get anything that was not made in China. And, and um, we have read some of the instructions. We've had a ball just reading through some of the translations that have come across. Obviously, someone who knows just a little bit of English has sat down with a dictionary and found words in the dictionary and, and just took them across into the other language. And it makes for some hilarious instructions sometimes. Sometimes you literally don't know what they are trying to say. Uh, so we all understand the problem of meaning. Um, in fact, um, I'm married, uh, as I think I have mentioned before. And, and conveying meaning that is in my male brain is not always that easy because my female mate has a female brain and she doesn't always understand my meaning. What did you mean by that? So a good thing in terms of marriage counseling is to say to the couple, always check what the person meant. What did you mean when you say that? Because I can jump to conclusions just like that. And it has caused major havoc in many a marriage, including my own from time to time, where I try to say something but I had a different meaning to what was attached to it by my dear wife who received what, whatever I said. Now, if that is the case between two people who really love one another, you can imagine when you do a translation from one language into another, how difficult it is sometimes to convey the actual meaning of that. It all has to do with the theory of communication, and that is something uh, originates in my brain. I put it into coded language, and it comes out of my mouth. You are now listening to me. There are all sorts of disturbances, such as a fly going into the, uh, into the, into the spotlight a moment ago. Uh, there's a disturbance, and in that disturbance, you are hearing what I have put into code language. You decode it, and it goes to your brain, and, and you then understand what I mean. But do you understand what I mean? And, and that's the problem of translation. It's the problem of communication. And so when we talk about Bible translation, we talk about some of the challenges that we have in Bible, uh, in, in communication, generally speaking, as well. Translation and interpretation. Supporters of the different approaches, those that I've mentioned, and I'll come back to that in a moment and explain them even more. But supporters of these different approaches actually accuse one another of changing the original. That was the accusation against Tyndale. He changed the Bible when he translated it into English. And, and oftentimes, these different views, these philosophies, are also in one another's hair. And they say, uh, you change the meaning, or you don't bring the meaning out properly. What was the original intention by the author, and how do we communicate that in another language? 
The truth of the matter is that any translation is interpretation. In fact, any communication is interpretation. Because the moment I say something, as I just said to you, and you receive it, you interpret what I am saying. That is interpretation. Now, the difference between the, the different views there is the liberty that we take in interpretation. Because any translation is already an interpretation. I need to understand what you said in language X so that I can put it across in language Y. And the moment I do that, I'm interpreting what you are saying. Now, of course, in terms of the philosophy, as I said, um, there are different approaches. That is, let's stick closer to the original and see how literally we can translate. Or a completely different, the opposing philosophy is, um, yeah, I, wanna, I want to know what, what the original says, but I want to communicate it to a modern audience in a way that they will clearly understand and there will be immediate um, understanding and, and insight into that language. So just some words about formal uh, equivalence. And that's the first one uh, on, the, on the whiteboard. The intention with formal equivalence is to, to try and give a word-for-word -word translation of the original by preserving as far as possible the words, the rhythm, the formal aspects of an original language. I am not a poetic type person at all. I'm far more analytical in my brain. Uh, that's the way I operate. But some people really appreciate uh, poetic style. And they can put together the most beautiful poems and hymns and, and songs and all sorts of different things. Now the difficulty is when you do a poem or a song in one language and you then try and translate that into another language, you lose out on rhythm on the ending of the word, sometimes they, they, they are very similar, uh, as you will find in any sort of little rhythm. There's a rhythm and a rhyme that you lose the moment you try and translate that into a different language. And I think all of us will recognize that. And so even in your word-for-word -word translation, there has to be some recognition that you cannot always hang on to the actual rhythm that is there. In fact, Hebrew poetry is very, very different to that of, of English poetry, for example. And then to do that translation becomes extremely difficult. But the idea behind the formal translations or the formal equivalents is to stick as closely as possible to the source language, even at the expense of the natural expression of the receptor language. And example being, let's stick as close to the Hebrew, which is the source language, even if we have to negotiate something of the meaning in English. Uh, maybe the English person won't, won't understand it 100%, but at least we are close to the original. That, that's the argument uh, over here. Then when it comes to dynamic uh, equivalence, the intention of a dynamic equivalence uh, is to give a thought for thought rendering of the source language. And therefore, it doesn't look at the words necessarily, the individual words, because the recognition is that the words... When you string them together, they make a sentence. Then the question is, what is the meaning? What's the intention of the author in this sentence? Now, once I can get my brain into the Hebrew or into the Greek, and I can, I can understand what the Hebrew or the Greek says in a sentence, now I turn to the receptor language, in our case English, and I'm saying, how will an English, a modern-day English-speaking person best understand the concept. I may negotiate some of the actual wording, the number of words, the rhythm, and so on, but at least what I'm doing is I'm making it clear to an English brain. Um, that is the philosophy behind dynamic equivalence. And here's a quote from Wikipedia. This approach attempts to convey the thought expressed in a source text at the expense of literal, literalness, original word order, the source text grammatical voice, uh, and so on. There are passages in, in the Bible, in the Greek, for example, where Paul, uh, in Ephesians, starts in chapter 1, and he writes one long sentence that is 14 or 15 verses long in our modern um, uh, example. Now, what the English does, like NIV and others, they break it down into manageable sentences. So rather than just try and follow strictly and literally what Paul says in every single little word in the Greek, um, 
they, they break it down into manageable sentences so that the modern mind can absorb that. The danger with the dynamic equivalence is that the original style, which sometimes may convey meaning, sometimes in the way you say something, not necessarily the actual words, but the way you say it, you may actually lose something. Let me give you an example. I'll give you the exact same sentence three times over. You are a real pumpkin. I'll say that three times, but I'll give you a context. I'm sitting at the dinner table, and Joan brings a plate, and she puts it right in front of me. And yesterday we had some horrible stuff that was uh, off and yellow and uh, I don't know what else. And suddenly she puts something on, the, on, on my plate, and I look down, and I say, you are a real pumpkin. What's the meaning of pumpkin? A vegetable. Am I right? No, it's, not, it's not a trick question. You, you may relax. Okay, um, my son just got his driver's license and he comes home and he says, Dad, I, I just had an accident and your car is a, is a smash, uh, is, is a, is a write-off. And I say, you are a real pumpkin. Am I talking vegetables over here? Well, maybe a vegetable up here, but uh, <laughs> certainly not a vegetable on my plate. And my two-year-old daughter runs into the living room and she jumps on my lap and I grab her and I say, you are a real pumpkin. What am I saying? You're stupid or you're a vegetable or you are just a darling. I've used the exact same sentence. With context, different meaning altogether. Do, do you get the picture? That's the difficulty of translating some of the things in the, in the Bible. Because I have described context to you. I have even used maybe a little bit of a facial expression. And certainly I can use um, my, my voice in different tones. You are a real pumpkin. Or you are a real pumpkin. You can even pick that up. The problem is we only read what was written to 2,000 years ago and longer. And we're trying to give meaning or to translate that into another language. That's the difficult. And, and this is not across the board. I have painted a very bad picture over here. It's not as bad as I make it out to be. But that is, uh, those are some of the challenges that are faced by Bible translators. Now, when we look at paraphrase, that is at the far extreme of the continuum that I have on the board. A paraphrase has as its focus the readability of the Bible text. It is how the reader will understand the words in, in, in her, his or her own language, idioms and expressions. It avoids any strange expression. And it uses much freedom in finding concepts in the receptor language to express the message of the Bible. Most churches and scholars do not regard a paraphrase as an official translation. Uh, in fact, even the translators will tell you, we, we've done this so that you can have a better understanding, but we don't mean that this is going to become your study Bible for, for keeps. And most preachers will refer to them at some point in time, but will not use them as an official preaching Bible, if I can put it that way, or to prepare their sermons and to deliver their sermons. There is also a, a more recent development, and it's called Optimal Equivalence, and I'll just read this to you, and it's from BibleGateway.com. This approach seeks to combine the best features of both formal and dynamic equivalence. In the, in, in the many places throughout Scripture where a word-for-word -word rendering is clearly understandable, a literal translation is used. In places where a literal rendering might be unclear, then a more dynamic translation is used. The Holman Christian uh, Standard Bible has chosen to use the balance and the beauty of optimal equivalence for a fresh translation of God's Word. It's been translated just a few years ago, and when you look at the continuum uh, on the screen, then optimal equivalence fits in uh, round about there um, on the continuum. Now, before we look at some of the English translations, which I want to introduce to you, we're going to take a break, and then we'll come back and look at some English translations. Okay, in this um, next part of the lecture, we'll get very practical as we look at some of the English translations, and then I'll end with some of the Bible study tools that are available. 
When it comes to formal equivalent translations now, remember we're talking about formal equivalent and literal translations now. Uh, there are several of them. Uh, the King James Version is probably the most well-known of those translations. And it, uh, the first translation happened in 1611. And it lasted for many, many years. And almost similar to the Latin. Uh, there, there was a time when people said, you can't touch the King James. This is the Holy Bible uh, sort of thing. And um, it, it's very difficult. Once people get used to a particular translation, to even start thinking about another translation. And so some of you may have had that experience as well. There is Young's literal translation. I'm not going to go through this whole list, but you can see the dates even as, as we look at the dates. American Standard Version, 1901. The New American Standard Bible, NASB, 1971. The New King James Version. Understanding that language has developed, which is the, the principle that I highlighted earlier on, uh, the these and the thous are dropped by the New King James Version. The philosophy of translation is exactly the same, but it has upgraded the language and dropped the these and the thous and the, that, that sort of, of uh, language that we no longer use. The New Revised Standard, and then there is the 21st century King James Version, uh, published in 1994, and the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is um, the combination of literal and dynamic as well. Some of the dynamic equivalent translations include the J.B. Phillips, uh, which was done in 1958 already and revised in 1972. And then there's the Good News Bible. Um, there are some people, and, and I would personally uh, put the Good News Bible a little bit further down the list, and I'll show you a, a slide a little bit later on, uh, just sort of listing these different translations on a continuum. Uh, but it's certainly further away even from the more literal. And then the NIV is typically your uh, dynamic equivalent translation, and it's the one that has become very, very popular. It has gone through a few revisions. Uh, there was the today's uh, new international version, TNIV, uh, where there was an attempt to uh, smooth out the male-dominant um, sort of uh, language uh, in the NIV. Um, that it, it met with some resistance, and so they've gone back to the drawing board, and uh, just recently, like literally two, three weeks ago, I heard that uh, the 2010, I think, edition of the NIV has now been published, and it's taking into account some of the response to the TNIV and also some of the changes that are necessary. Uh, typically where Paul would write and say, now my dear brothers, uh, in his mind he is thinking about the church, so obviously he would say, uh, or we would today say brothers and sisters or congregation or church. So it's sort of more generic language wherever that is possible, but not touching the essence of the Bible. We have contemporary English version, 1995. Um, I've already referred to other um, NIVs. And then there's a New Living Translation um, as well. Some of the paraphrases, Moffat, Moffat's New Translation in 1924, um, it is well known among scholars. They often refer to the Moffat uh, translation or paraphrase. The Cotton Patch version, I will have a few comments about that. Uh, it is a very, very interesting one, and I'm going to give you a little picture on that in a moment. And then the Living Bible. Many of you are very familiar with the Living Bible. In fact, uh, if you were a child or a young person, maybe 30 years ago or 20 years ago, you would have grown up knowing about the Living Bible if, if the Bible was at all part of your frame of reference. And the Living Bible has a, an interesting and neat little story behind it. It's a man who in the evenings read to his children. And uh, instead of just reading literally from the English translation, he put it in language that his uh, young children and eventually teen teenagers could understand. And eventually wrote all of that down. And someone suggested to him that that, that sort of approach be published. And that was the background to the Living Bible, where the Living Bible is a paraphrase using so, sort of more um, modern language. And then most of us today are familiar with Eugene Peterson's The Message. Now, The Message is a, a, a paraphrase. There's no doubt about that. That is the philosophy behind uh, The Message. And Eugene Peterson is Canadian. Um, and in fact, this is one of the limitations of a paraphrase. It, it dates very, very quickly because the language is so modern and hip and with it, that within 10 years and 15 years, the language is dated. 
And uh, with a message, for example, it's a, it's a wonderful tool to use. But personally, as a South African, I don't identify with all, the, all of the language in, in, the, in the message because there are some things that just don't fall easily on my ear. A part of that may be my Afrikaans background, but part of that I think is simply because I'm not Canadian. Uh, and he has written a, a paraphrase uh, that, that speaks into that sort of situation. Now, there are radical paraphrases, and I've referred to the Cotton Patch version. I just wanted to give this to you as an example, and you will, you will actually enjoy this. But here is the information that comes from rockhay.tripod.com. The Cotton Patch version is firmly planted in the cotton fields of the southern United States, not Palestine. And, and that, is, that is the philosophy. It's saying... We live in the southern parts of the U.S. We don't live in Palestine. We don't identify with the concepts and the language of Palestine anymore. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, for instance, became the letter to the Christians in Birmingham, Alabama. And the early Christian church, which struggled to integrate both Jews and Greeks, became the movement which joined, uh, joined white man and Negro. Now, of course, there's a context here. You're talking 30 years ago, or actually more than that, about 40 years ago, probably, and so some of the wording here, even th this, this is why I'm saying to a paraphrase will date so quickly. Because if you have a radical paraphrase like the cotton patch, it cannot be used by anybody outside of the U.S., number one. And secondly, even within the U.S., the word Negro is totally unacceptable uh, nowadays. You never, ever use that word um, in that context. But that is what he literally used in those days. And it not, not because he was a, a racist at all. In fact, quite the opposite. He was trying to talk about the unity and the need for unity among the different races. Now, let me give you an example. This is a quote from the Cotton Patch. The book of Acts becomes happenings. Uh, that's the title of the book. So, happenings, chapter 1, verses 8 to 12, read as follows. Um, just listen to this. But as the Holy Spirit comes over you, you will get power and will be my agents in Atlanta and throughout Georgia, in the ghetto and across the land. As he said this, and while they were watching, he was carried away and a cloud kept them from seeing him. As he went away, and while they were still staring into the sky, two men in blue jeans joined them and asked, <laughs> Citizens of America, why stand there looking at the sky? This Jesus who was carried away from you into the sky will come just as you saw him going into the sky. Then they returned to Atlanta from Peach Hill Orchard, uh, which is the suburbs of, uh, in the suburbs of Atlanta, when they got back, they went upstairs where they were living. This included Rock and Jack and Jim and Andy, Phil and Tom, Bart and Matt, Jim Alston and Simon the Rebel and Joe Jameson. Now, this is a radical paraphrase, as you can gather. It is totally dated, but um, you, you can search for this on the internet and you can do some more reading uh, of this as well. Now, as you can see, uh, even on that scale, it is probably to the far right of that particular continuum. But it just gives you an idea of how far people are sometimes uh, willing to go in terms of making it very applicable. Um, and even, in, even at that particular time in the whole of the U.S., this would be totally unacceptable. There would be small pockets of people who could identify with this kind of approach. And so one of the challenges for any uh, translator today is, like the NIV, how, how far do we go to make it acceptable and readable to people across the whole world, uh, people who use English uh, as their language. So those are some of the challenges that they face. I just want to run through some of the dates, more important Bible translation dates. 390 AD, Jerome translated the Bible into Latin. In 500, already there were uh, about 500 different translations uh, of the Bible. In 600, the Latin version is seen as the only official and legitimate translation. In other words, only 100 years after it has already spread to 500 different languages, it was almost narrowed down to the Latin Vulgate at that particular stage, or what became the Vulgate. 1384, Wycliffe translated the Latin into English. In 1516, Erasmus produced a parallel Greek-Latin version. And then in 1522, Martin Luther published the Bible in German. 1526, Tyndale published the printed English New Testament. 1530 to 1534, Tyndale translated some additional books, uh, such as Jonah, Pent the Pentateuch, and revised the New Testament as well. 1560, the Geneva Bible. Uh, 1611, the official King James Bible is printed with the Apocrypha. 
And it was only removed, the Apocrypha were only removed in 1885. So we're talking about two centuries later. 1885, the revised version, uh, which was the first major revision of the King James. And then 1901, the American Standard Version, which was an American version with, with the American spelling and everything else, but it was based on the King James style. 1973, the NIV. 1982, the New King James Version, which is a revision of the language. When we talk about translation, there, there, there are many, many miracles, and missionaries especially will tell us about the many miracles around uh, Bible translation. The Bible continues to be the most translated book in the world, and that is no exaggeration. That is literally true. The following numbers are just approximations, and they are a year or two or three old even. As of 2005, at least one book of the Bible has been translated in 2,400 of the 6,900 languages. Now, there's still work to be done. You can, you can even see that. Not even a half of the known languages around the world uh, has access, uh, have access to, uh, to, the, to at least just one book, even, uh, of the Bible. There are 680 languages in Africa, followed by 590 in Asia, 420 in Oceania, 420 in Latin America and Caribbean, 210 in Europe, 75 in North America. The, the UBS, United Bible Societies, are presently assisting in over 600 Bible translations. Um, that does not include Wycliffe and other organizations with the exact same focus. So many people are working uh, in terms of Bible translation uh, around the world. So one of the questions in your mind probably is, why yet another English translation? I mean, we have the NIV. I'm using the 1984 one. Uh, why yet another one that is now being published is probably the question. The reality is that languages are alive. They change. They are dynamic. They develop. The King James Version, Elizabeth, Elizabethan uh, English is no longer used or even understood by most people around the world. Changes in culture, developments in language, uh, more discoveries in terms of the text of the Bible, grammatical expressions may necessitate a revision. Uh, certain words change meaning. The word gay had another meaning 50 years ago to what we are using it for today. There are many, many such examples. And so one has got, you, you have to bear that in mind. And you can't have one translation and say, this is the official and for the next 500 years, that's going to be the official English translation. In fact, they date very quickly and become outdated. And therefore, there is a need for new translations. So... I want to challenge you and invite you to enjoy your English Bible. People fought for it, and, um, and you, you are the beneficiaries. I am the beneficiary of that. We have many, many good English translations of the Bible, and perhaps too many. That is also true. Many of us may sit with two or three or five different Bibles or translations uh, in our possession. Nowadays, with uh, internet and software packages, we have multiple language, uh, multiple translations in English uh, available to us. With, with the click of a button, uh, we can actually make a comparison between these different uh, translations as well. But the question that you may have is, how do I choose a good translation? Now, generally speaking, most evangelical conservative churches use the NIV uh, Bible, which, which I have in my hand over here. This is the, um, the cheap one that used to be uh, published by the uh, Bible Society uh, of South Africa. They have lost the, uh, the copyright or the right to print this particular NIV, and so they've switched to another version. But it's still available, and it's still one of the most popular Bibles, trans Bible translations in English uh, around the world. But how do I choose? I mean, if I want to do something, I want to study or, uh, or whatever, I, I want to do more Bible study, how do I choose a good translation? So let me give you just a couple of thoughts on that. Determine your purpose for wanting a Bible. It is best to use the more literal translations uh, all the way to the New King James. I wouldn't go to the Old King James, but the New King James Version. If you want to do a proper literal study of the Bible, most of you will not have access to the original languages, Greek and Hebrew. Uh, and even if you start studying them now, it will take you several years before you are proficient enough to actually do the study in the original languages. So my suggestion is get a more literal translation uh, so that you can do the study in a language um, that is more literal and, more, and closer to uh, the Greek or the English. Uh, the Greek or the Hebrew, rather. 
use more than one translation. I, I cannot tell you how some passages in the Bible begin to open up just by reading different translations on that continuum. Um, as a sort of a general rule, if you study the Bible, I'm not talking about a person who has never been introduced to the Bible, but if you study the Bible, don't start with a paraphrase. Uh, because that is on the far end of that continuum. Start with either dynamic equivalent or the literal ones. And make a comparison. And you will be, you will be amazed when you start seeing the different translations and how they, how they almost support one another or they may open up some of the words. And remember, most of them have used the original languages for their translation. Nowadays, it's very uncommon for a Bible to be translated from another translation. They all are translated from the Greek or the Hebrew. Read the introduction. Now, if you use this NIV, for example, there is, there is an introduction right at the beginning. It's called the preface. And it says the New International Version is a completely new translation of the Holy Bible made by over a hundred scholars working directly from the best available Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts. Now, I hope that after last week, at least some of this will make sense to you now, whereas perhaps before last week you didn't know what this would have meant uh, necessarily. It had its beginning in 1965, and, and then it tells you the story of how these people got together, who they are, and what the philosophy of translation is. And it covers uh, at least five pages, very small print, in this particular copy of the Bible that I have. And every other translation that you pick up will have an introduction, where they will tell you the, the philosophy and the approach and the background and the history, in short, in brief. Uh, of that particular translation. So go to the introduction and find out what approach they have taken. And then, by all means, make sure that it's not a translation of a translation. I told you that some of the English translations in the earlier days were from the Latin. So they took the Latin and translated the Latin into English. That's a bad approach. You want someone who is able to access the Hebrew and the Greek, the original languages, and make a translation directly from there. Now, of course, any translator will consult widely. Um, nobody's going to lock themselves in the room with a Greek and a, and a, and a, and a Hebrew text and, and, and force themselves to do the translation from there. They will read the NIV or the King James or whatever to find out how those things have been translated, but essentially they use the Greek and the Hebrew text to do so. Let me give you one example of the different languages. Most of us know Psalm 23, and I'm just going to quote uh, verses 1 to 4. I won't read all of it, but here is the King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If you're a little older here, you will recognize the language. I didn't grow up with this because I grew up in Afrikaans. But it says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Now, even reading that, if, you, if you're in a church where they still sometimes sing some of the older hymns, you will recognize the language. The these and the thous occur in some of the older hymns, and they have not, many of those hymns have not been modernized. Uh, and, and that is the, the reason why new translations are necessary. Even new songs are necessary uh, because we, we need to recognize that some of the older language uh, does not communicate that well. The New King James Version, you will notice immediately the exact same language, but the these and the thous are, drops, are, are dropped. Um, the Lord is my shepherd. And by the way, when you see uh, is there is in cursive, it says that that little word does not occur in the original language. There's no verb. Uh, the, the Hebrew says the Lord, my shepherd. Um, and and it's, a, it's a grammatical construction in Hebrew that means the Lord is my shepherd. Now, the King James philosophy is so literal that, they, that if that little word which is assumed in the Hebrew is not there, they will indicate that by a cursive, printing it in cursive. And so that's why it's printed there like that. It makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And you can see there how the translation has just been smoothed for a modern audience. But when you compare it with the old King James, it is exactly the same style. 
The NIV says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And then the Living Bible. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. There's a very, very important switch over here. Do you, do you see that? Let me just go back to the, the NIV, which is the similar language to that of the King James. It says, I shall not be in want, which is a negative statement. I, will not, I, I shall not be in want. But the Living Bible says, I have everything I need. Now you can see the jump on that continuum. It's now saying, what does the modern English mind understand better? I shall not be in want or I have everything I need. Which is the one that the modern mind will understand better? Living Bible says the latter. And therefore they opted for a, a smoother translation if you wish. But in doing so, they have taken a step away from the literal translation or from the, the literal Hebrew. He lets me rest in the meadow grass and leads me beside the quiet streams. He gives me new strings. He helps me do what honors Him most. Do you see the, the, the huge jump from which is a lot more literal in both the NIV and the King James to the Living Bible? And here is Eugene Peterson's The Message. And it, it no longer even indicates the verses. It has now decided to just indicate paragraphs because it is, it, the attempt is, is now to translate paragraphs and not verses or words. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through death valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. You, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. Gone is staff and all those references uh, because the modern Canadian doesn't understand that. And so Peterson's argument, philosophy is, I'm going to speak a language that the modern Canadian can understand. Do you, do you understand the differences between the translations? So when you choose a translation... You've got to make sure you understand the philosophy of translation, uh, and that is normally given in the introduction. Now, here's a slide that I refer to. It's uh, roughly the same continuum that I have on, on the whiteboard, uh, but you can see a slightly different language. It's from form-driven, which we call formal equivalents. Um, here they call it the form-driven versions. Uh, you don't have this printout. It, didn't, it doesn't print out. Uh, it's a picture but from form-driven versions, which is the King James, and even uh, NASB, which is even more conservative, uh, all the way down to uh, meaning-driven, all the way down to paraphrases. So that's the continuum that I have on the whiteboard as well. And you can see the translations ESV and the NIV. There's the NIV, roughly. Uh, the, the, the NIV is on the far left side of meaning-driven, uh, if you wish. Whereas the King James and the NASB, New American Standard Bible, is on the far left of the form driven. And so on a continuum, you can literally plot every single translation uh, on that continuum, all the way down to the message um, and, and so on. And, and, and the cotton patch version here would be off the screen, all right? <laughs> Uh, there's, no, there's no place on the continuum for the cotton patch. Uh, it is just so, so... Um, relevant to the modern society that it is far away from the Hebrew and the Greek. Okay, that's all about Bible translation. Um, for the last little bit of, of this lecture, I'm going to talk to you about some tools for studying your Bible. And this is a brief introduction. I would love to expand. I would love to show you some more samples and examples. And next week, we're going to do a bit of a Bible study at the end of our, our time together. I'm going to show you next week a particular Bible study method that has, that has helped me. And it's still the method that I use even when I prepare, prepare a sermon uh, today. Uh, but that is for next week. Uh, today, I just want to... Uh, introduce you to some of the tools that are available to anybody and everybody uh, out there who would like to study something about the Bible or in the Bible. The Bible is, is clear enough for anyone to read, to understand our need of God, and to come to a personal knowledge of Christ our Savior. There, there's no doubt in my mind I can put the Bible in anybody's hands and say, 
uh, just don't start with Leviticus uh, or with Numbers or something like that. But by all means, read Romans, read Matthew, read John, um, read the Psalms. And there is enough in the Bible that anybody can understand. However, having said that, there is much in the Bible that causes, uh, that, that causes major confusion, uh, which really needs proper interpretation, which is where the Bible study helps come in. Where do we, how do we find our way around that? This is why we rely on good resources to assist us in our study, especially of the difficult passages. There are some, some passages you don't have to necessarily worry about. But having said that even, I mean, even if you read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Most of us here probably grew up uh, in, a, in, a, in an urban environment and not on a farm where uh, we have seen shepherds. And even if we have sheep or uh, a flock here in South Africa, it is different in the Middle East. Uh, and shepherding there happens in a very different way to the way it happens over here. So even there, you need some help to open up that world for you. We talk about the background of a particular passage. Some words, some concepts have a background, have a development. And those things you won't know unless somebody tells you. And this is where the Bible study helps uh, come in. And there are many, many resources available. I'm, I'm literally just going to scratch the surface. Printed material, Bible commentaries. Um, there are hundreds and thousands of Bible commentaries written on every single book of the Bible. I, I plucked one from my, uh, from my shelf, and this is the Broadman Bible Commentary, volume number 8. Um, and there are, I think, 15 or so uh, in this particular series. This one covers uh, some general articles on the New Testament. Um, and so the, the first seven volumes cover the Old Testament. This one is the first one in the New Testament, and it covers Matthew and Mark. Uh, those two books. So when you go into the book, it, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, it will explain, it will expand, give you background, and this we call a Bible commentary. And as I said to you, there are hundreds and thousands of those. Uh, that's the Broadman uh, series. Another very popular one uh, is the uh, IVP series. Um, the Tyndale, actually it's called the Tyndale uh, commentaries, and this one is just on Psalms one to 72. There are two volumes uh, in, just on the Psalms, and, and every book in the Bible is covered in the Tyndale series. And there are plenty of different series of commentaries. Um, so there are many, many of those. And then you have single volume commentaries, such as Matthew Henry. Uh, some of them are expanded. I mean, one version of Matthew Henry is, a, is an expanded version. Another one is an abridged version. It's a shorter version. But it's all the books of the Bible in one thick volume, sort of like this. Um, and, and those are commentaries. They comment about every verse or every paragraph or every chapter uh, in the Bible. Bible dictionaries, I've introduced you to that, so I'm not going to expand. But they contain articles on topics in the Bible, whether it's a name, a place, or a concept that you find in the Bible, and um, they are listed alphabetically, and you can find your way around that. And so you want to know about shepherding. Uh, we talked about the Lord is my shepherd. Then you go to the word shepherd or farming. Uh, and you, sometimes you need to page around and try a few, little, a few options, but eventually you'll find your way around the, 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 the dictionary. Um, and, and these are all printed materials. And a Bible atlas, a Bible atlas, I showed you a couple of those as well. They contain information about the geography, the background, and the history of the Bible uh, more often than not. It helps you to get a perspective, especially if you've never been to Israel. Um, those atlases may help you to get a bit of perspective. Where did Jesus travel, or uh, where did um, Abraham come from, and how did he travel to get to Canaan, and where was Egypt? Uh, all those kind of things. Uh, those things are explained in a, in a Bible atlas. There are other things such as Bible study guides. These are shorter books with questions mostly. Uh, these are the kind of things we use in small groups and Bible studies. And uh, uh, they, they lead you through a book or a topic, uh, but they, they primarily um, use questions to draw out some information. Uh, some of them contain some introduction or introductory notes. Uh, others will have some information right at the back. Some have leader guides where the leader guide has some more information than the ones that you use for the members of your small group or your Bible study. A Bible concordance helps you to find a verse. You know, um, there was that verse again um, about, 
about marriage, um, about marrying uh, uh, or, or being yoked or unequally yoked or something like that. Now, a concordance, where is that verse? A concordance does that. It helps you to find the verse. So in that uh, memory of mine, I will then go and have a look at marriage or marry or yoke or unequal. Those words are literally all listed with every single verse that is fine, fine, fine print. I mean, to the point where I now need glasses in order to read what is in, on this page here. But every word in the Bible, except for some prepositions and so on, but every other word and name in the Bible is listed with all the references in the Bible to that. And that is called a concordance. And that's a physical, a printed one. A study Bible... Um, I've referred to the uh, ESV study Bible before. It's, pr it's one of the uh, more recent publications. It's going to become a fairly standard work uh, in the future. But you have a, a King James study Bible. You have an NIV study Bible. And a study Bible is a wonderful book for most of, the, of us at, at our level. And that is one single book. It has the print of the Bible at the top. It has comment, like a commentary, like these. But... These do not include the print of the Bible. You have to have the Bible on the side and read the text, the, the Bible verse, and then go to the, the commentary. Whereas your study Bible actually has the Bible printed and then comments on the bottom, at the bottom. And then it depends on the kind of study Bible. Some have articles at the back. Some even have a mini version of a concordance at the back as well. They're wonderful tools because they bring together most of the things that I'm talking about here, but obviously not at a deep, deep level. Uh, the moment you start expanding, you would then have to buy different or well, multiple volumes of different things. There are also multiple translation Bibles where they have been printed side by side, NIV, King James, uh, and let's say the message uh, in three columns. So in one single view, you see all three of those translations. Those are just printed materials available to us. The reality is that we are moving on uh, from printed stuff. Most of us are. Uh, and we no longer rely so heavily on the printed books uh, anymore. And therefore, <clears throat> um, my suggestion is that you also look at something to, that you can put on your computer. One of the challenges that I personally find with a computer is the thing needs to be booted up. And um, for me to find a verse quickly, I mean, it's like now. Someone is phoning me. Someone is on the phone. I don't have my computer or my laptop on. Where do I find that? Now, I'm, I'm almost forced to go to some physical book on my shelf. Um, and, and that's the challenge with a computer. Um, I don't do quiet time well on a computer. I still have a physical Bible that I read. But I have Bibles on my computer. And the one that is, that is over there is a software package that I have on my computer. There, there are, there's a whole range of different software packages that you can buy. But PC Study Bible... Um, is one, Logos is another one, or Logos, uh, you would probably pronounce that. <clears throat> there are many different um, uh, sources available uh, for that. And then eSword is a free download that you can download and install on your computer so that you don't have to be connected to the internet in order to use it. Many of the classical or the older books have expired in terms of copyright and they are now becoming freeware. And they are online. You can download them. They are included in stuff like PC Bible. Matthew Henry, for example, is an old, old commentary. And PC Bible includes Matthew Henry. It includes a whole range of other resources that are uh, available. And they become uh, known as public domain. And then, of course, you can go straight online. And the Internet has become a major source of information. Um, and, and the list is so long that there's no way that I can include all of that. But I want to uh, refer to you to BibleGateway.com. Um, it's an online tool where you can search. You can search words, verses, concepts, uh, and there are plenty of other resources, but you have to be online in order to use them. Crosswalk.com is another uh, uh, good source with a wealth of Bible and Christian living topics. And then ChristianityToday.com. Uh, is another one that you can use. And, and this is just a, a very, very brief sample of the host of things that are available online. 
Just a word again about eSword, because most of you would probably want to try this out if you don't already have it. A uh, PC study Bible may cost upwards from $50 uh, dollars and more, U.S. dollars. Um, so you're talking 400, 500, 600 Rand uh, if you really get a good PC package to install on your computer. Uh, and there are other cheaper ones available as well. But eSword is actually free. Uh, and, and it is above board, it is legal, there's nothing illegal about uh, eSword uh, and it's been around for many years and it has been expanded uh, like you can't believe over the last uh, number of years. And you can, you can download that, I have given you the, the link www.esword.net. Um, you can install it on your, on your PC, your laptop, uh, your, your tabletop PC or your laptop or a palm, if you have a palm, which is now becoming redundant with new phones. Um, your smartphone can download the Bible and many other resources. I'm not sure about eSword on your, on your phone, actually. It probably depends on the size of the memory uh, of your phone. But it's easy to use, no internet connection, because once you've downloaded it, you install it on your whatever you use. Uh, updates and more resources are added. Um, I haven't checked it recently, but there is a list as long as my arm of Bible translations from Russia to Afrikaans to all of the English translations. Some, uh, like NIV, at one stage you had to pay an amount to get the NIV because it was copyrighted. Um, but most of the others are freeware and you simply just download them and you have them on your computer. It comes with a large number of Bible translations uh, in English. So now that you know, uh, what prevents you from getting to know your Bible? Well, I don't know what prevents you. One of the things that prevents me is often time. And I'm sure that's probably the first thing you're going to say, time. I don't have the time to do it all. But I want to put it in another way, and that is, can you afford not to use the time to actually study your Bible? And the reason why you are here is because you have a desire to know more about the Bible. I can only do so much in terms of the time that we have together. The rest is up to you to go and read your Bible, to study your Bible, and to make sure that you do further study in terms of the background and so on. A couple of things to do. Go over your notes again. Do some more research on Bible translation. Read the introduction to your Bible. If it's the NIV, read that whole introduction. It will, be, uh, it will really be an eye-opener. You probably never thought about that. You probably start with, started with Genesis or with Matthew or something else. But, but just do yourself a favor and read the introduction to see what is behind the translation of the Bible. And then uh, visit a Christian bookshop and just get an idea of the available Bible study tools. Your, your mind will explode when you go into these Christian books and you see all the resources that are available. There is nothing that prevents us uh, from, from studying the Word of God. And then do some surfing on the internet. Uh, and if in doubt, ask. Ask your pastor. Ask a, an experienced person uh, who has done some study. Not everything on the internet is kosher. Please. There are lots of chamors on the internet, uh, just total rubbish, um, but, but there are also some wonderful, wonderful things uh, on the internet. So do some research in that regard and see what you can find out. Now, next week, uh, we'll be looking at the topic of inspiration of scriptures and how it impacts what we believe about the Bible. Um, I'm going to then introduce you to what I believe to be a very, very helpful study tool uh, without even... Uh, starting with the tools that are available, starting with the text of the Bible itself. And then if you registered for the certificate of completion, then um, your uh, guidelines for the exam will be available next week. So don't leave next week without those guidelines. And then for next week, you must memorize all the books of the New Testament, the names of the book, books of the New Testament, all 27 of them. So have a good week and may the Lord bless you and study your Bible.